Chapter 19 The United States in World War I, 1916-1920 It was called the War to End All Wars, or the Great War. The Spanish-American War that we just finished made the United States an international empire, but actually compared to Europe's colonial empires, its, our overseas possessions were small. And our empire was not territorial so much as it was economic and cultural. At the start of the 20th century, the world's economy was already highly globalized, and although Britain still dominated world finance, and its currency dominated world trade, we, the United States, had become a leading industrial power. In 1914, the year the World War I began, the United States more, made more than a third of the world's manufactured goods. Its steel, its oil, its agricultural equipment, and consumer goods inundated European markets. And along with American goods moving to Europe were Americans, especially those from national and ethnic groups that were interested in the lands of their origin, such as, you know, Irish Americans uh, who were trying to fight for independence from England, and the American Jews who were opposed to religious persecution in Russia, and, and of course the black Americans hoping to uplift Africa. But our increasing economic and cultural connections with the world, well, it, it led to an elevated American military and political involvement. Between 1900 and 1920, many of the principles that guided American foreign policy for the rest of the 20th century are going to be formed, like our open door policy, investment information and cultural, which are going to flow freely to other nations and markets. But we Americans discussed our foreign policy in terms of freedom. And rhetorically, this was expressed in a widespread belief that America spread its power and influence in the world not out of narrow economic or strategic interest, but to promote universal ideas of liberty and democracy. And Woodrow Wilson, with his policy of liberal internationalism, best represented this tendency as Wilson believed that political freedom would follow wherever American trade and investment flowed. Well, World War I became the test for his ideas and for the progressives who supported him. They sought to make the war an opportunity to reform America and the world. Before Wilson's president, of course, we've had Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt is quite the dude. He's one of my favorite presidents in history. Uh, Ringtail tube, as I like to call him. Short, very robust. And this picture of him laughing, he laughed a lot. Uh, he believed, well, he divided the world into civilized and uncivilized nations. And he believed that the former were obligated to establish order in a chaotic world. He was far more engaged in international diplomacy than his predecessors, and, and while he disclaimed any American interest in acquiring overseas property, he ordered multiple interventions in Central America. His first major action was the engineering the separation of Panama from Colombia in order to build a canal linking the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. In 1903, when Colombia refused to cede the land for the canal, Roosevelt helped to launch an uprising in Panama, and then he deployed American gunboats to prevent the Colombian army from suppressing it. So having secured Panamanian independence, and a treaty giving the United States the right to construct and operate a canal and have sovereignty over the canal zone, Roosevelt launched one of the greatest construction and engineering projects in history. And there you can see, it's sure going to cut down time. There's no way around it. I took the canal zone, he later explained. The project, finished in 1914, would facilitate American and world trade by drastically cutting shipping lanes. As you can see, this is a picture of the canal from the Gulf of Mexico all the way over to the Caribbean. Now, Roosevelt's interventionist foreign policy came to be known as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine which expressed the right of the United States to exercise an international police power in the Western Hemisphere, uh, allowing it to not just to prevent European intervention in the Americas, 
as the Monroe Doctrine had specified, but also forcefully to intervene whenever it deemed we it, it deemed it necessary. But Roosevelt feared that financial instability in the American, well, it just simply invited the European power to intervene whenever they felt their investments were threatened. So in 1904, Roosevelt invaded the Dominican Republic to ensure its custom houses repaid debts to Europeans and American investors. In 1906, he sent troops to Cuba to ensure the stability after a disputed election, but they stayed for three years. Now, President Taft, well, uh, Roosevelt's hand-picked successor, the man never wanted to be president. His wife wanted him to be president. His uh, friend, Teddy Roosevelt, wanted him to be president, and he's the man that was sent to the Philippines to set up the government. Remember, all Taft ever wanted to be was a judge, but he was groomed and he won the election, and he sent Marinas to Nicaragua to protect the government friendly to American economic interests, but he emphasized economic investments and loans from banks rather than sending the military in. He felt this was the best way to spread American influence, throw money at it. And of course, this policy is known as the dollar diplomacy, whereas with Roosevelt, his policy was known, speak softly, carry big stick. He attempted to, shall we say, shape the economics of the Honduras and Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic and even Liberia. But he didn't win re-election. A uh, man named Woodrow Wilson did. And Woodrow Wilson is a very moralist person. He kind of brought a missionary zeal and a sense of his very own and American righteousness to foreign policy. Now, he had the distinction of being, uh, only had one elected office before this. He was the uh, governor of New Jersey. Prior to that, he had been president of Princeton University. His claim to fame was that he had no political experience, so he wasn't corrupt. He took William Jennings Brown, Brown, uh, Brown Bryan, who happened to be an anti-imperialist, made him his secretary of state. He repudiated Taft's dollar diplomacy. He promised to respect the Latin Americans' independence and free it from economic domination. But Wilson did believe that the United States had a duty to instruct other nations in democracy and that American exports and investments spread American political ideas. So for Wilson, the American economic influence served a per purpose higher than profit, and his moral imperialism made for more military interventions than any president before or since. He sent Marines to Haiti in 1915. He sent Marines to the Dominican Republic in 1916. He, uh, to protect, I'm sorry, to Haiti 1915, Dominican Republic 1916. He did this to protect the American financial interest, and they stayed in the country uh, in Haiti to 1924 and the Dominican Republic in 1934. He was very involved in Mexico also, where in 1911 revolution, led by Francisco Madero, overthrew Diaz's long-standing dictatorship. Well, two years later, without Wilson's knowledge, but with the support of the United States ambassador there and the American companies controlling Mexico's oil and mines, military commander Victorano Herto, H-E-E-R-T-A, he assassinated Madero and seized power. Wilson was livid. He wouldn't extend recognition. He had vowed to teach those Latin Americans to elect good men. And when civil war erupted and Wilson sent troops to Veracruz to prevent armed shipments, uh, well, they were met as invaders and attacked by Mexican troops. So in 1916, after troops led by Pancho Villa killed some Americans in a New Mexico town close to the border, President Wilson ordered 10,000 American troops to invade northern New Mexico, or not New Mexico, but Mexico, and apprehend Pancho Villa. Well, it ain't going to happen. World War I. Who started it? Most of us nowadays, it, it's just something you don't even really hear. You know about World War II, maybe. Uh, if you're lucky, you might remember the first Gulf War, 
uh, you, you've never heard of the Korean War. You, you, you just, you know, the Vietnam War, you may know a little bit about because it's been in the news a little bit more lately. But World War I happened more than 100 years ago. Uh, there's no survivors from it left. You don't know anyone that was in it. It's not romantic. And it, it's just ancient history. But World War I, folks, it's... If we hadn't had World War I, we wouldn't have had World War II or Korea or Vietnam. World War I was the worst thing that could possibly happen. And what started it? Well, the assassination of the uh, heir to the Austrian Holy Throne, Throne started it. It was an incident that happened in a very small country halfway around the world. And it escalated into a full-scale war. So why did it last so long? And when it was over with, there was 14 million dead, 7 million disabled, 4 monarchies had been totally destroyed. We see the beginnings of communism and fascism. Farmlands are devastated. An entire generation of French youth are killed. And to add insult to injury, as soon as the war is over, the swine flu, the Spanish flu, not the swine flu, the Spanish flu hit. And 40 million more died. As a matter of fact, we had 3,000 die there in Kentucky. June 14, 1914. The way, the time when hell started. But just do a little bit of background first. Uh, something called a balance of power is very important in Europe. And there's... Major powers, you know, like Russia and France and Germany, and then these are major powers in, in Europe. And when you look at France, France in the 18th century had been at the top of the heap. Had a large population, uh, good monarchy, people were proud of it. But now she's fifth in population in Europe. Her military has not been updated in decades. It's kind of weak, poorly trained, and poorly equipped. They're way behind in industrialization. I mean, everyone's ahead of them, including Belgium. And ever since they've had their revolution, they're extremely nationalistic. They're more blustered than they are powerful, but they're still France. Austria and Hungary, it's really two nations that have been put together. It, it combines Hungary and Bohemia and Czechoslovakia and Romania and Austria. They, they, all under one big umbrella. They're ruled by a Catholic monarch from the old Habsburg dynasty. They have an oppressed peasantry. They're also very nationalistic, but they're a weak, doddering nation trying to control too many people who are not Catholic. Russia. Ah, Russia. Russia has no middle class. She has an absolute monarchy. The nobility is not loyal. They had a revolution in 1905 with the peasants. They got in a fight with Japan, and Japan kicked their collective ships. They wanted so much to be known on the stages of Europe, and they kept marrying European royalty. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Tsar of Russia at the time of all this is going on is a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. They lacked power and prestige in Europe. People laughed at them because they were like the country cousin who comes to dinner. Uh, they got natural resources. They had the potential, but they don't have the, as the French would say, the savoir-faire. Then you've got Great Britain, major sea power, queen of the seas. But she's a very, very small army, but she is mammoth in an imperialism. Uh, the expression, the sun never sets on the English Empire, was quite true. Major industrial power, and the one thing she has that these other countries do not have is a stable government. Yes, they still have a queen, but they have a constitutional monarchy. The parliament runs the business. Italy. Oh, Italy. <laughs> I can't have a smile when I think of Italy because I love Italian food. and I've never met an Italian I didn't like. They're very recently united as a country, and they're not a major power, but boy, they do want to be on the stage. They're very divided politically. They've got mammoth social and economic problems. They're spending for their military way beyond their means. And they want to become an imperial power so badly. Everybody else has got colonies in the world, and they don't have any. They want some. And you've got Germany. Major sea power. Monarchy, absolute. 
extremely militaristic, one of the leaders in the Industrial Revolution, and out of all the countries in Europe, she's the one that's best prepared for war. She's got transportation facilities, she's got railroads, she's got mammoth factories going, she's got the people behind her, uh, her army is trained, best prepared for war in the entire Europe. Now Germany and Austria-Hungary and Italy, they're in an alliance. It's going to be called the Central Powers. Great Britain and Russia and France. I know you're thinking Russia and France and Great Britain. These people are traditional enemies, which we get into just a bit. They're going to be called the Allies. Then you've got this group called the Balkans. It's between Italy and Europe on the Adriatic Sea. And it consists of Bosnia, Bulgaria, Serbia, Albania, Montenegro, Romania, and Greece. And they're all being controlled by Austria-Hungary. And as you can see, there's not a Catholic among them. Europe in 1914, as you can see, I'll use my sticker, Germany, Austria, Hungary, right through the middle of Europe. You got Russia over here, and you've got all this over here. They, they think they're surrounded. Uh, Germany feels very insecure, because she's got enemies on both sides of her. France on one side and Russia on the other. So Germany begins a very massive navy buildup at the end of the 19th century. Okay. Russia is unhappy with the German and Austrian-Hungary alliance, and it causes a conflict with Austria-Hungary. But Britain looks over and sees Germany building up her sea and considers it a threat. So if Germany's going to have more ships built, then we're going to have to build some ships. So Germany increases the size of her army, and France looks on, and she becomes alarmed, so she builds up her army. Now, there hasn't been anything said. They're just looking at the other and going, hmm, they got it. I'm going to have to get it, too. So you can say Europe's becoming a powder keg, just waiting for a match. And everybody in Europe, very leery of what's going on in the Balkans. I see here, I don't know if you can see it or not, this is the boot. This is Italy. Here's the Adriatic Sea. And Right in here is what we consider the Balkans. You have Greece and all this and everything through here. And they want to be free of Austria-Hungary. I don't know why I've got two maps. I guess the other one this shows you a little bit better. It's just a mess of countries over there. And each one of us so zealous as what we have to watch the balance of power. Now, this is background only, and so you don't need to take notes on this particular bit. The Balkans are demanding independence, and they're pushing Europe closer to war. Because Austria annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Austria agrees to support Russia's move to open the Dardanelles and give her a warm water port. Well, Russia, Russia failed to achieve her objective, and Serbia threatens to invade Bosnia to liberate. 1912, Bosnia attacks the dying Ottoman Empire and captures the Turkish Empire, the European territory of it, all except Constantinople. And Serbia gains Albania. And Austria says, no, I don't think you're going to do that. She wouldn't let her keep it. So Serbia is forced to surrender what we now know as Albania. Enter the Archduke and his wife, the Duchess. June 14, 1914, Sarajevo. They're visiting, and he's already made the statement that when he becomes the leader of the Austrian-Hungary Empire, he's going to grant these people their solidarity. He's going to let them, well, not let them be free, but he's going to let them have a more free hand. Two separate attempts were made on his life. While he was in Bosnia inspecting the maneuvers of the Austrian army, the one that was stationed there, and he devoted one day to a procession through the capital, and during the morning drive through the capital, a bomb was thrown at the motorcade, and but it, the occupants escaped unhurt. But in the afternoon, in another part of the town, a Serb student fired a revolver at the car, killing both the Archduke and the Duchess. Now, that's... Some say it was a student. There is an alternate theory to the Sarajevo attack being that a Serbian military intelligence operation, and it was the Black Hand. Now, this Black Hand was a shadowy organization formed in Serbia as a counterweight to the Bulgarian-sponsored international organization. And most of us historians believe that this is what it was. It wasn't just some misguided student. But now the stage is set. 
So Kaiser Wilhelm, the leader of Germany, responded to a note from Austria by Austria said, we've got to eliminate the Balkans. It, it, it's just getting beyond, I've had it. I'm not going to put up with it anymore. And Kaiser says, okay, fine, I will back you. In other words, he gave him a blank check. Anything you want to do, we'll back you. And so it begins. Austria sent an ultimatum to Serbia. Russia hears the ultimatum, and Tsar Nicholas was given the worst advice any leader of the countries had ever been given. His advisor says, we need to prepare for war, and the Tsar says, no, I don't think so. We don't need to do that, because it'll look like we're trying to get ready for war, and the Russian general said, oh, no, so everybody does it. They'll think we're on maneuvers or something. And the Tsar gives his okay to prepare for war, and ha, 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 ha. Uh going to happen fast now. Britain thought Serbia was an unrespectable state. Now, she had received a note from Serbia and, Aust and in Germany, not Serbia, but from uh, Austria and Germany, uh, saying, you know, we're going to basically spank Serbia. And Britain basically said, you do what you got to do. You know, it's none of my business. Uh, they're not my religion. They're not my people. Uh, I don't care. Now, the Shefflin plan is named after a man named Shefflin, who had come up with a plan to take France by going through Belgium. If you go through Belgium, you'd knock out France, and you'd have one enemy off your back. Then all you got to worry about is those Russians on the east. But Germany hears that Russia is preparing for war and declares war on her. The British says, oh, no, we're not getting in this. Mm -mm, mm -mm, stay out of it. We don't want any part of it. August the 3rd, Germany demands access to cross Belgium. And, of course, it was refused because Belgium is, is a neutral country. She's had a, a treaty with those nations for decades and decades. Well, the day after the she was refused, Germany says, basically, screw you, I'm coming through. And, and she did. And as soon as she crossed into Belgium, Britain declares war on Germany. Now Europe's at war again. The war should not have happened. When it did, it should have stayed local. I mean, it didn't, it didn't involve us. It didn't involve England. It didn't involve France. It should have stayed between Austria and Serbia. But this is June 14th, the Archduke is assassinated. August the 2nd, Germany crosses the Belgian border. And the war is on. But it's about less than six weeks from the time it actually happened the assassination. And the fighting begins. And for the first time... The war is going to be using airplanes and tanks and hand grenades and machine guns and gas. The mustard gas was really hor horrible. But there was also actions in Syria and Palestine and Iraq. There were the Arabian Peninsula. There were revolts in Ireland. There was a re Russian revolution. Uh, it was just seemed like everything is coming totally untogether in Europe. But the main reason for the war was four, and I, I call them my isms. Nationalism, imperialism, militaryism, and I couldn't find the word for the allianceism, so we're just saying the alliance system. Uh, each country was extremely nationalistic. Each country had little empires going. Each country had a lot of militarism and those crazy alliances. And now the stage is set for America's entry into this, what's going to be a slaughter. But we're really deeply divided. We don't really know who to be loyal to. Because our country is made up of so many different ethnic groups. One of the reasons given for us not going to the war is because it might cause a civil war here. Uh, some... They wanted to back the British because of liberty and democracy, and they were our mother country. They didn't want to back Germany because Germany was repressive and had an aristocratic government, and they were very autocratic in their, their talking. You know. The Germans and the Irish didn't support the British. The Irish hated the British because they didn't have their freedom. The Russian Jews did not want to support Russia. But you've got Britain and Russia and France are allies. And you've got feminists and pacifists and social reformers here at home believed in peace, not war. So President Wilson does the honorable thing. He declares neutrality. 
but all this naval warfare going on over in the North Sea and in, in the eastern part of the Atlantic is starting to disrupt our shipping and our commerce. You're getting into our hip pocket. May of 1914, the British ship the Lusitania was sunk by the U-boats, which is untersea boot, a uh, fancy German word for undersea boat, untersea boot, which we shortened to U-boats. And the uh, submarines were something new. 1,200 people died and 124 of them were Americans. Wilson sends a letter of protest. And Theodore Roosevelt, the former president, and other business leaders urged the U.S. to prepare for war. Now, Wilson is what we call an Anglophile. He uh, admires anything English, the English language, the English literature, the English laws. Uh, he's even been known to dress a little bit like an Englishman. He called Germany a natural enemy of liberty. At the end of 1915, he orders the U.S. military to begin preparations for a possible war. Here's the line of the Lusitania on postcard, big old dude. 1916, Wilson sends a very strong message to the Kaiser that you can't do this and get away with it. You're, you're killing my people. And Germany suspends submarine warfare on any non-combatant. In other words, if you've got a supply ship or something, it's not going to fire on you. If you've got a, I don't know why anybody taking a vacation, but if it, you know, just tourist things, no. So Americans could travel freely and not be afraid they're going to be shot down. 1916 is an election year. Wilson runs on the slogan, he kept us out of war. And he wins re-election on his peace platform. And very early in the next year, 1970, 1970, he starts calling for peace without victory. He has a vision of world order. He wants to go down in history as the man who stopped this horrible stuff going on over in Europe. But all of a sudden, Germany refuses and resumes her submarine warfare against all ships. Anything coming to and from England is going to be sunk. And he starts sinking American merchant ships. You see, the secret was Germany hoped that she could starve England into submission before the U.S. got mad enough to really enter the war. Because we're an unknown quality. March 1917, British Britain makes a uh, public a letter called the Zimmerman Telegram. Uh, it was a telegram from Germany to their ambassador in Mexico, uh, Mr. Zimmerman, uh, telling him to get hold of the Mexican government and ask them to declare war on the United States. And if Mexico declared war on the United States, and of course they're going to help them win, when they won, they would get back all the territory they'd lost, you know, like California and Texas and all those states. Well, that ain't going to happen. Meanwhile, there's a revolution in Russia. They eliminated the Tsar. And what they call a constitutional republic is established. Yeah. On April the 2nd, President Wilson goes before Congress and requests a declaration of war against Germany to make the world safe for democracy. Okay, let's stop here just for a minute and back up and review again, just, just real quickly. Militaryism, imperialism, nationalism, and the alliance system, those were the main reasons that the powder keg in Europe blew up. 1916, Wilson runs for re-election and campaigns on peace and progressivism and keeping our boys at home. Because trade's on our mind and we're, we don't want to be involved in the war. Because if we're not involved in the war, then we've declared neutrality. And in our way of thinking, we should be able to trade with Great Britain and Germany. But war breaks out and Britain blockades German ports. It starts limiting goods that we can sell to Germany. And we're saying, we're not taking, you know, military goods over there. And they said, well, anything you take over there to them, even if it's cotton, they can make it into uniforms for the military. So it's war goods. It starts forgetting, forbidding all foodstuffs and most raw materials. And it's censoring all the mail. And blacklisted American firms dealing with Germany. And it started stopping ships, our ships, and confiscating the cargoes. President Wilson protests. Well, Britain didn't really want to get us angry, because if he got us angry enough, we might come to the war on the side of Germany. And uh, we're raising cane, and the president's saying, you know, like, for instance, we've got this shipload of cotton that our American farmers have grown, and we got a contract to sell it to Germany. And if we can't get it over there to deliver to them, our guys are going to be out of money and everything else. And 
and England said, I'll tell you what, says, we'll buy it. Well, you know, the farmers that grow cotton in the South, they don't care who buys it as long as somebody buys it. And so we agree that uh, <laughs> well, England's going to buy the cotton. And then England says, um, just a minute, Mr. President, he says, um, we have a small problem. We haven't got any money. Would you lend us some money to buy the cotton? And we did. Now, they did repay us after the war, yes, but I, I just thought that was so silly, so funny. They want to buy it, but they hadn't got money to buy it, so they borrowed money from us to buy our own product. Oh. In reality, the real deterrent to trade were the U-boats. But our U.S. trade is starting to grow. Between loans and trade, we're getting closer and closer to the Allies, which are Britain, France, and Russia. As I said, the central powers are called Germany and Austria, Hungary, because they're in Central Europe. Undersea boot submarine. It's so new a weapon that we don't have any rules for it yet. And yes, there's rules in warfare. Like I say, in August of uh, 1915, Lusitania and the Arabia were sunk. Sunk at uh, March the 15th, March 1915. I'm sorry, Americans had been killed. In 1916, Germany declares unrestricted warfare against all arms vessels. Wilson protests, threatens to break off diplomatic relations. The Kaiser backs down and they issue something called the Sussex Pledge because it was a Sussex boat that had been sunk. And there's a short period of peace, and Wilson runs for re election on peace. And I just thought this was absolutely hilarious. Uh, we didn't used to have a lot of campaigning, but beginning with Wilson, we do. We have this truck running around with signs on it. So Wilson redoubles his efforts for peace. He sends a message to all the nations at war. He wants peace without victories. Now the Allies refused, but they said they would think about it. The Central Powers go, no, 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 no. They're being very invasive because they know that Russia is on the brink of collapsing. Now on January 31st, 1917, Germany announces all ships would be sunk on sight. So Wilson, true to his word, breaks off relations, but he's still hoping for peace. Then we had, just a few days later, we had that Zimmerman telegram saying they're trying to get, you know, Mexico to declare war on us. And the very next day, Wilson requests some merchant ships to arm, and although some senators tried to block it, he goes ahead and gives the order anyway. Two months later, on March the 13th, the Navy's instructed to start firing on any submarine as soon as they see it. Meanwhile, the U-boats sink five American ships. Because, like I said, they didn't have any real rules, and so they were operating on outdated rules. The submarine was supposed to surface, order the boat to uh, let them board it, come aboard, and get the men and women off, uh, seize the cargo if they wanted, and then sh to you know sink the ship. Well, now what ship's going to stand there while all this is going on? As soon as they seen that tower on the uh, submarine come up out of the water, they're going to start shooting back. It's just, we don't have any rules yet. And on April the 2nd, 1917, Wilson calls a session of Congress in a special session and requests a declaration of war. And we had some people who held out for four days. No, 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 no. So April the 6th, 1917 is the date we use as the declaration of war, with 40 House members and six senators still voting against us. And the war begins with a burst of patriotism. Oh, we have more songs coming out of that era. And it's like anything else. You've got to work up to it. And for those of you who are old enough to remember the first Gulf War, we had months of propaganda at us. And during this short period right after the Declaration, it's the worst month of the war. 800, 881,000 tons of Allied shipping are sunk. The French armies actually, in a mutiny, they're, they're just dropping their guns and leaving. The British are in Flanders, their bribe is stopped. Russia, who'd had this revolution, signs a separate peace treaty with Germany. She's out of the war. And German and Austrian forces rout the Italian army totally. It does not look good. And we're not prepared. I mean, <laughs> General Black Jack Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Force, uh, he's a good man, but he's just been given an awful big task. In April of 1917, he had 200,000 officers and men. Most of them were old and really should be retired. 
You had 300,000 old rifles that they'd been used, some of them, in the Civil War. You had 1,500 machine guns. You had 55 outdated airplanes, of which only less than half would even fly. Uh, they had two radios. And their most recent military experience had been chasing Pancho Villa, and they hadn't caught him either. They called our boys the Doughboys. And they so young and eager and slim and trim and going to war. They passed the Draft Act, or call, excuse me, the Selective Service Act in May of 17, and for the first time, African Americans were drafted. As a matter of fact, four African American regiments were sent. And after the earliest offensive over there, Allies dug in the trenches, and there is a YouTube that I want you to watch about the why we've got the trenches, how they're behaved in the trenches, and it, it doesn't show you anything gory. There's a couple of gory ones, but this just tells you basically, you know, da da da, this is this and this is that, and they do this and they do that. It's kind of pablum me, but you don't need to see people getting killed. The first Americans reached France in June of 1917. Over there, over there, the Yanks are coming. By March of 1918, there were over 300,000 Americans. And by war's end, there was more than 2 million American soldiers over there. And our merchant marines and our navy's doing a good job because no more troop ships were sunk. March 8th, that should be 1918. <laughs> Germans launched a very massive assault in, on the Western Front. And the Allies are driven back almost to 50 miles from Paris. And by July the 15th, the Germans threw all reserves into a drive for Paris, but after a three-day battle, they were pushed back and were stalled, and then the Allies attacked. September the 12th, 1918, 500,000 Americans and French drive the Germans from St. Michel. Two weeks later, 896,000 Americans were on the attack in the Argonne Forest. We're moving. Now this shows you the Western Front. It runs all the way, it looks like, from the... Uh, well, you know, all the way across eastern France, or right into the, this is where the most fighting took place, right in through here. October the 6th, 1918, didn't take long, Germany appealed to Wilson for an armistice. Turkey and Bulgaria and Austria, Hungary are already out of the war. Russia's out of the war. But it's not ready yet. It's going to be 4 a.m. on November the 11th. The Germans are going to actually sign the armistice. 11, 11, 11. You'll, you'll see that come up in here. Trivia things. The American Expeditionary Force lost 448,909 killed. 230,000 were wounded. Disease and missing brings the total kill to 112,000. But in reality, as much as that is, it's less than 1% of the total of 10 million killed. And, and that, that's such a hard number to wrap your brain around because you can feel sympathy if the lady next door, her husband gets hurt or has a heart attack. But when you hear about millions of people dying, you just, huh? It, it's just a hard number to have any sympathy for. But at home, what was it like at home? We had a government agency called the CPI, or Committee on Public Information. It was strictly propaganda. And they would make movies and, and have posters that make the Germans look like thirsty Huns. They'd have big buck teeth, which they didn't have. They'd have those crazy pointy hats. And they always be hunched around like a monkey. They're after pretty little girls. And they made a lot of movies, anti-German films. And, and we're trying to drum up anti-German sentiment. The school stopped teaching the German language because it was too autocratic. We could no longer eat sauerkraut because that's German, so we went to Liberty Cabbage. In the bars, you couldn't have any pretzels because they're German. No orchestra works by Bach. So anything written by a German composer wasn't played. The German-American and anti-war figures badgered, beaten, and killed. You didn't have to do anything. If you just happened to be born in Germany and migrated over here, or your parents were in German, you could be beaten and killed. And the president did nothing to curb it. He issued the statement, Woe be to the man or group of men that seeks to stand in our way. Uh, 
And then it's what usually happens in any war. The government wants to protect her citizens. And just like the Alien Sedition Acts way back in the 1790s and our Patriot Act we have right now, the Espionage Act of 1917 was passed, which gave the Postmaster General permission to remove any material from the mail he considered seditious or libelous. The Sedition Act of 1918 uh, passed a law that penalties on anyone using disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the government, our American flag, or our armed forces in uniform. And Eric had gone just a little bit bonkers. Anything that wasn't red, white, and blue was no good. The Socialist Party was harassed. The Industrial Workers of the World, I, WW, I, and yes, they were socialist based. Eugene Vebs, the leader of the Socialist Party, was arrested and convicted of violating the Espionage Act and sent to jail for uh, act and sent to jail for ten years. And hostility fostered anything. If you weren't one hundred, actually one hundred and fifty percent red, white, and blue, and it's going to lead to what we're going to call the Red Scare after the war. But it, it, teachers had to sign loyalty oaths. Uh, anything that remotely smacked of anything that wasn't 100% Americanism was taken out of the textbooks. Uh, if all you had to do was have your neighbors say, I think they're not loyal Americans, and you were you were in a world of hurt. Meanwhile, Wilson actually sends American troops into Russia, and then he economically blockades Russia because he doesn't want to recognize this government. Uh, what we're sending weapons to is the anti-Bolshevik insurgents because we're sending it to the White Army, which was the Tsar's army. So the Bolsheviks were the Red Army. Like I say, he refused to recognize Lenin's government. And those troops had a terrible time getting back. They didn't get back out until 1920. And meanwhile, Russia's raising pain because we've got troops on foreign soil. The cost of the war. More than 5,000 new government agencies were created. But the actual dollar cost of the war was $32 billion of 1917-18 money. Meanwhile, we sold $23 billion in Liberty Bonds and the 16th Amendment. Uh, we tax the corporation and personal income now, and especially when the corporation is pretty high, and we raised another $10 billion. Add it up. We made money on that war. We came out way ahead. One of the agencies created was the War Industries Board. Uh, it was the most powerful new agency created. They put a man in charge of it, uh, Barad Baruch. Very good man. There's a Food Administration Agency uh, in charge of Herbert Hoover, a future president. He's the one that came up with meatless or, and or gas this day. I mean, we'll go this day and we won't use any gas. We'll have more gas for the troops. We'll go this day and we won't need food because we have more food for the troops. And a man named Garfield uh, was in charge of the Fuel Administration, and he's the one that came up with the idea of daylight savings time. And if you have trouble remembering him, just think of the cat, Garfield the cat. But the government's beginning to intervene in American life big time. And you've got a union and they want to go on strike? Okay, go ahead. Because when you walk out the front door, the military is going to walk in the back door and take over. So why go on strike if you're not going to shut anything down? So labor got the message and they began to work with the government. But yay for the government. They forced companies to pay women equal wages for equal jobs. But there's still a big labor shortage. And we send people to the south and we recruit the African Americans down there to come to the areas that we have the defense plants in to work. We raise the quota for Mexican Americans to come in. and. Anything. We needed warm bodies because the warm white bodies were being put in uniforms and going overseas. You have a lot of women taking over men's jobs, so you have to have somebody come in and take over those women's jobs. But there were people who opposed the war, like the IWW, the International Workers of the World, and the Socialist Party. The first woman in Congress, Jeanette Rankin, opposed the war. Charles Lindbergh, good old Lucky Lindy, he opposed the war. But the CPI, the Committee on Public Information, began to issue mammoth amounts of pro-war propaganda. Like I say, the German Kaiser and the German anti with the anti-thesis of freedom, nothing but a bunch of bloodthirsty Huns. And the whole time, we're using the language of democracy and freedom. 
but this use of language started to cause demand for expansions at home. At first, Wilson seemed to endorse women's suffrage. Then he started backing off. But we've got a new generation of women activists. And they began using tactics such as civil disobedience. They're actually putting on pants and walking in demonstration, carrying signs in front of the White House. They're also pushing for prohibition. Oh, my. Our birth rate's down. Our men are gone. And we, what we need to do is Americanize the immigrants that are in here. Now, in 1917, Congress passed the 18th Amendment, which didn't take effect until 1920. But the war initiated the most extreme repression of civil liberties in American history. To give you another for instance, if you didn't buy liberty bonds, you were investigated. And as I said, people were encouraged to spy on their neighbors. Men would be stopped on the streets and there'd be a demand to see their draft cards to prove that they were registered. It was used to get even with people you didn't like. It was used to further your own self. And, of course, we had race problems. Uh, they've been subject, these race problems were subject for debate before the war. And not just blacks and whites. The U.S. Immigration Commission even had a list. And the Anglo-Saxon were at the top of the list to be allowed in. The Hebrews and Northern Italians were next. Not Southern Italians. The Southern Italians are at the bottom. Because each one of them had its own alleged innate characteristics. And as I said, the white women's birth rate's declining. And it's threatening our civilization. And we've got this new science we just heard about called eugenics. Oh dear. Eugenics is eliminating the unfit to make more room for the fit. Same type of thing Hitler's going to try in a few decades. And we've studied the alleged mental traits of different races. And the claims seem to be legitimate. These are professional people issuing these things. So we're going to have to Americanize everybody, have a homogeneous national culture, a melting pot, if you would. All the immigrants are going to be forced to merge. Teachers and private leaders and employers and union leaders and social reformers, public officials, everybody was rounded up to help do this Americanization. Here's an Americanization celebration. See all the children with the flags. They don't look real too happy, do they? The Ford Motor Company created a sociological department. They would actually go out and enter immigrants' homes and they'd examine their clothing and their furniture and their food. They'd force them to enroll in English language courses and if they did not comply, they were fired. Now some, and I've got a few there, respected the immigrant culture and some thought undesirable should be excluded. Then we started using IQ tests and weed out the socialists, sterilize the mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Now Ford had an instituted English school, and this is an example of graduates for the English speaking school. Of course, the Mexicans were exempted from the 1917 literacy rules, but they were discriminated against, just like the Jim Crow laws against the African Americans. Puerto Ricans were made citizens, and the men were subject to draft, but they couldn't vote. Asian Americans, well, after 1907, there was no further Japanese immigration except for the wives of children of those who were already here. In 1913, California banned all aliens incapable of becoming citizens from owning or even leasing land. But the African Americans, oh dear, bless their hearts. They were excluded from almost all progressive ideas, disenfranchised totally in the South. They were barred from labor unions and any skilled jobs. And the females worked for the very lowest possible wages at jobs that were no one else would want to do. But all progressive intellectuals and the social scientists and the labor reformers and the suffrage advocates, they all seem to be unconcerned about the black population. And even President Wilson began to impose racial segregation in federal agencies. He fired black federal employees. And he even screened that White House birth of a nation. He also uh, made the uh, bathrooms and restaurants around the White House segregated. W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the founders of the NAACP and editor of its magazine, The Crisis. He was born in Massachusetts, free African-American and Harvard graduate. 
He did not like Booker T. Washington's accommodationism. He uh, wanted all the legal rights that we're entitled to now. He believed there should be a talented 10 of African Americans to the upper class to fight to inequality. They met in Niagara Falls in Canada and they had this Niagara movement going and they began to demand the restoration of the black vote in areas that the men had been disenfranchised. And of course they demanded an end to segregation. They demanded equality in economics and education. And back in 1909 he was one of the upper class educated blacks to join the white reformers to help form the NAACP. And all this war talk, well, you know, since we're using freedom and democracy and liberty every time we turn around as our words, it gave them some hope. And Du Bois called on African Americans to close ranks and enlist. The Navy wouldn't let you join. The Marines wouldn't let you join. The Army, you could join, but you were always in a segregated unit. The Merchant Marines was actually the ones that had the most liberal policies. Now the United States sees Russia as a threat because we've got this communist takeover over there. Regardless of what they call it, it's communist and they're calling workers of the world unite and overthrow capitalism. Wilson would love to trade with Russia because there's so many people, but he feared communism. And because they'd signed a separate peace treaty with Germany, Russia was not invited to the peace talks at Versailles. And Wilson refused to recognize the Russian government totally. It's just a picture of Versailles, it's a beautiful castle. Can you imagine living in something like that? They got the best of chandeliers. But Wilson, Wilson is a very pious, very religious man. And like I say, he doesn't really have all that much political savvy behind him. So he decides it would be a good idea to prove to the Europeans how much the American people were behind him. So he asked the American people to elect all Democrats, no Republicans. Well, of course, the Republicans got angry, and I don't know about you, but somebody tells me to do one thing, chances are I'm probably going to do the opposite, and that's what happened. But he decides he's going to lead the peace conference to Paris, which is something that's unheard of. The president doesn't do this. He took no member of the Senate. He took one Republican who was a meaty mouth. He took no and we had some great political savvy people who were Republicans and Democrats, especially Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. He was a great diplomat. But he didn't like Wilson, and Wilson didn't like him. When he arrived in Europe, he was greeted by huge crowds that called him Wilson the Just. And this is just part of a picture of a crowd. And, and President Wilson took it as they loved him. And they didn't realize that they would have loved anyone who had gotten rid of the Germans. The conference in Versailles lasted from January through May. 20, 27 nations there. <coughs> Excuse me, but the big four dominated. Clemenceau of France, David Lloyd George of England, Wilson of the United States. Russia was not invited because uh, she'd signed that separate peace treaty. The general consensus seemed to be to punish Germany and make her take full responsibility, take away all her colonial empires, and pay huge war reparations. Well, Wilson had wanted the 14-point plan. He had, uh, he wanted self-determination for all these countries. Uh, he wanted the League of Nations. And of course, Article 10 was the heart of his plan, where all members of this new group was going to look out for the other ones, especially their independence and their territorial integrity. Of course, Wilson didn't get all he wanted, but no matter how you look at it, the treaty was guaranteed to fail. But his ideas of equality clashed with the European rulers who wished to rebuild their empires. And a side note, it's not in your text, but a man called Ho Chi Minh went to Versailles to request freedom in French Indochina from the French colonial rule. It didn't happen. And for you who were not informed, French Indochina is now today known as Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh became the leader. But the map of Europe was totally redrawn by the victors. The old Ottoman Empire was divided into the nations of Syria and Iraq and Palestine, which of course the British and the French are going to govern. All the German colonies in Africa were given to South American countries and Australia and Japan. Ireland was not given her independence, and we created some new countries, Estonia, 
Austria-Hungary was divided into two countries, now the country of Austria and the country of Hungary. You got Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia became Yugoslavia, the port of Danzig went to Poland, and Alsace-Lorraine Alsace went back to France. And of course, none of these people were asked. You've got people, for instance, who speak German are put into another country. You've got Muslims put in with other kind, other religion. It's just ridiculous. Now, this was, as I said, the map of Europe in 1914, as you can see. That's why it's called the Central Powers, because it's just right straight central. You've got Germany and Austria and Hungary right here in the middle. But now look what happens when you see the map. Look here. All these new countries come in. You have Poland and all of them. And Germany's been really sliced down. Some of his ideas actually called anti-West feelings. But Wilson returns to the States with a treaty in hand. But unfortunately, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts, as I stated earlier, he does not like Wilson personally. He does not like him politically. And he says, no. He says, this limits America's freedom of action. It gives them the right to come in here and do anything. If they think we're being up naughty, they can come over and, you know, do what they want to do. And Wilson refused to compromise, and then Lodge refused to compromise, so there's a stalemate. So the treaty didn't get signed. Then Wilson, go, Wilson goes out, brainstorm, uh, what they not call it brainstorm, they call it, um, I don't even think what it's called. When you go out and try to drum up the American public and get them to contact your senators and say, you know, vote this way. And while he's there, he has this massive stroke. And so the last couple of years of his term, uh, no one ever saw him except his wife, Edith. And the rumor started flying hot and heavy that Edith was running the country because everything had to go through her. She was even more zealous of him than Nancy Reagan was of Ronald Reagan. But Wilson's idealism of a commitment to democracy and open markets and trade and a U.S. mission to instruct the world on freedom did live on. But of course, Warren G. Harding ran for president and was elected in 1920, and his platform was to end Wilsonism and return to normalcy. And so for the first two decades of the 20th century, now they've come to a close. And next we've got the 1920s, or the Roaring Twenties of the Jazz Age. Now I have a list of eight questions here that would be very, very good for you to at least look at and think about because there's some good questions here. Uh, I've got a YouTube to explain trench warfare. I've got a very brief, I think it's a 30 second one to introduce you to the Black Jack Pershing. And that's it. Uh, 